Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Florida is the single most popular Halloween event in existence. It's a high-budget and incredibly ambitious event that continues to grow larger every year. The houses are intense and insanely creative in ambition and scope. No other Halloween event can even come close to touching it. The budget allocated for the house design must be massive, and so one has to wonder, will anyone ever be able to top Universal Orlando for Halloween? Well, I think that once upon a time, Disney was very capable and certainly very willing to experiment with more intense experiences. Join me today as we travel back in time to the Disney era of Michael Eisner and explore the Disney version of Halloween Horror Nights that very plausibly could have been. Today, Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party is a staple event of Magic Kingdom. Starting as a single-night ticketed event in 1995, the party has continued to grow in popularity as a family-friendly event that celebrates Halloween without actually being scary as the title states. The event itself is essentially Magic Kingdom at night with a party atmosphere and designated locations where you can trick-or-treat for candy. It also includes special Halloween shows, fireworks, and a parade. It's certainly a fun time, and the appeal is also the family-friendly atmosphere. But that's what we expect from Magic Kingdom or Disneyland, right? Disney is often perceived as a family-friendly place, and so the party obviously reflects the target audience. However, I imagine that there was a time when things could have gone very differently. The year is 1984, and Michael Eisner has just become CEO. Alongside him was Frank Wells in the role of COO and President of Walt Disney Productions. The two men were brought in as outsiders intended to right the ship after the company was threatened by corporate raider Saul Steinberg who attempted a hostile takeover of the company through stock purchases. After having Steinberg bought off, Roy E. Disney, who was the son of Roy O. Disney and Walt's nephew, collaborated with his business partner Stanley Gold to oust then-CEO and President Rod Miller. Ever since the death of Walt himself in 1966, Walt Disney Productions was in a financial rut, not really producing successful films, and the theme park stagnated. There were mild successes in film here and there, and they were certainly willing to experiment, but the lack of financial stability was what allowed the company to become so vulnerable to corporate rating. When Ron Miller was ousted, Eisner and Wells were brought in to revitalize the company, and the current size of it today is a testament to their success. A number of measures, such as increasing the price of theme park admission, emphasizing merchandise, and revitalizing the animation division with what would become the Disney Renaissance led to great financial success. Disney also diversified its film portfolio through Touchstone Films, Hollywood Pictures, and Miramax, allowing the company to be a larger player in the family film market, as well as producing many adult films as well. Who knew that Pulp Fiction was actually a Disney film? However, in the parks division, Eisner was attempting to change perceptions. Disneyland, Magic Kingdom, and the new Epcot Center were seen as great family destinations, but were definitely missing out on teenagers and young adults. In an attempt to draw this market in, Eisner focused on more bombastic and thrilling attractions that also drew from pop culture. In 1985, Videoopolis premiered at Disneyland, which was a music video-themed dance club. The appeal was that it existed almost as a nightclub for a younger crowd, but was safe from drugs and violence as it existed within Disneyland. That was the, uh, idea, anyways. Previously, as president of Paramount, Eisner developed a working relationship with Steven Spielberg and George Lucas when he took a chance with greenlighting Indiana Jones. At Disney, 
Eisner enlisted the creative help of Lucas through a contract that allowed him to develop five different attractions for the theme parks. The first of these would be Captain EO in 1986, which premiered at the Imagination Pavilion at Epcot. Featuring Michael Jackson, the show was a 3D music experience that was intended to be relevant with a younger audience, just as Videopolis was. The show was brought to Disneyland next in 1987, which was also the opening year for the next Lucas-produced attraction, Star Tours. Extremely innovative for its time, the new attraction brought you into the world of Star Wars using the Atlas Hydraulic Simulator, based on military flight training technology. Like the previous two attractions, Star Tours was meant to appeal to a younger demographic and was an absolute smash hit. The attraction itself would also come to both Tokyo Disneyland and Disney MGM Studios in 1989, and opens with Euro Disneyland in 1992. The Disney parks also saw an increase in thrilling attractions that incorporated the signature of excellent theming that Disney was known for. It's reported that Splash Mountain was approved by Eisner in a meeting with Imagineering because his son walked up to a mock-up model of the facade and said that it looks cool. Disney was on track to become not only more competitive in the film market, but in the theme park division as well. By drawing in a younger crowd, the idea was to have the Disney parks appeal to all age groups instead of just families, and this turned out to be quite successful. However, Disney was just getting started. One of the many issues with Disney leadership in the pre-Eisner era was how the parks were not seen as direct competitors with other entertainment. It's true that nothing came close to the success of Disneyland or the Magic Kingdom, but that didn't mean that the profit potential of the parks was really being tapped. For example, Disney perceived the Magic Kingdom as the primary reason to visit Orlando, and that any other attractions that popped up alongside it would only help to bring more tourists, and subsequently more people, to the park. A number of different Florida attractions already existed within the area, and a number of others would be built to get their slice of the pie. One of the largest competitors was SeaWorld Orlando, which opened in 1973, only two years after the Magic Kingdom. When Eisner stepped in, the only two-year-old Epcot Center was already planning a major expansion with the Living Seas Pavilion, where the intent was to bring guests up close with the science of ocean exploration. While already in development, Eisner saw this pavilion as a direct way of competing with SeaWorld's aquariums, and so this was the first step in many of diversifying Disney's hand in entertainment. Unlike the small footprint of Disneyland, Walt Disney World had enough space to become a multi-day resort and theme park destination. The Magic Kingdom and Epcot Center were already there, so why not keep expanding? When Eisner was still president of Paramount, Universal gathered a number of studios together to look for potential investors in a new project. With their studio lot in Hollywood having become a small theme park by this point, they were looking to expand into Florida, right next to Walt Disney World. Having been present in those meetings and privy to the plans for this park, Eisner almost immediately announced a new park for the resort when he became CEO, which was to be themed around movies in Hollywood. The idea was to obviously deter Universal from entering the Florida market, and even the layout of the original park which became Disney MGM Studios was rumored to be blatantly lifted from the original plans that Eisner had seen. In a way, this is a good thing because it forced Universal's park to become far more ambitious if they were to compete with Disney. The park itself was intended to be a working movie studio with a tram tour like in Hollywood, but instead took small segments of that tour and blew them up into full-scale attractions. Meanwhile, Disney MGM Studios, while great, opens with only the great movie ride, their own version of the tram tour, and a small handful of shows. Disney opened their park first in 1989, and Universal Studios Florida followed in 1990. This was Disney's first major attempt at taking a concept and doing it the Disney way, intending to make competition irrelevant. One issue with turning Walt Disney World into a multi-day destination was the lack of hotel rooms. The resort opened in 1971 with only the Polynesian, the Contemporary, and the Fort Wilderness Campgrounds. Disney figured that if they could expand their hotel offerings, they could keep people on property and have them spend more there. 
Disney hotel offerings exploded in the late 80s and continued to expand into the early 2000s. Resorts ranged from deluxe experiences to moderate experiences to value experiences. There was a price point for everyone, and this hurt Orlando's hotel industry because Disney was offering lodging in their own unique way. Disney also decided to compete with Florida tourism itself by offering its own version of a timeshare program called Disney Vacation Club, which was and still continues to be a success. Eisner was not satisfied though. In 1977, the creator of SeaWorld, George Millay, founded the first water park right in Orlando. Called Wet n Wild, this was a brand new type of amusement park that focused on water elements and slides. Disney had just opened River Country in 1976 at the Fort Wilderness Campgrounds, and while we might consider it a form of water park, it was fundamentally different. Because of Wet n Wild's popularity and the introduction of other water parks to the surrounding area, Disney decided to jump into this market as well. Their first real water park opened in 1989 as Typhoon Lagoon. This park was larger and more ambitious than what the competition offered, and what made it Disney was the immersive theming and story that was woven into the fabric of the park. Later, in 1995, Disney would open its second water park, Blizzard Beach. Again, what made this park stand out from the competition was its ambitious attractions and theming. Moving away from theme parks, Disney was also interested in retaining that young adult audience. In 1975, Disney opened the Lake Buena Vista Shopping Village, which was soon renamed to the Walt Disney World Village. In 1989, its first major expansion would come with Pleasure Island, which was Disney's version of a nightclub district. They had found that a lot of young adults would leave Disney property at night to go visit the Church Street Station bars located in downtown Orlando, and so their answer was to develop their own Disney version full of unique experiences, and like Videopolis, it was intended to be safe because it was carefully controlled by Disney. Again, that was the idea, at least. The last major Eisner era expansion to Walt Disney World would be in 1998 with the opening of Animal Kingdom. Here, the intention was to compete with Busch Gardens Tampa, and while Disney did everything they could to let people know that the park wasn't a zoo, that was very much something it was also competing with. It wasn't just Walt Disney World, though. Disney retail products were brought to malls all around the United States with the Disney Store, and two of them even had test kitchens for a fast food franchise called Mickey's Kitchen. Michael Eisner toyed with the idea of a marketable Disney car, and Disney even acquired the search engine InfoSeek, hoping to become a fundamental player in the search engine space. Undoubtedly, this would have been just another way to direct people towards consuming Disney products, but it's interesting how diversified the company of the Eisner era became. Disney even attempted to compete with paid educational workshops by opening the Disney Institute, which was intended to allow you to vacation while also taking classes in the arts and humanities. In 1985, Premier Cruise Line struck a deal to use Disney intellectual property on their own cruises, and when the contract expired in 1993, Disney pursued their own endeavor in the industry with Disney Cruise Line in 1995, which continues to be successful to this day. I'm sure that there are plenty of other examples that I could use, but I think I've illustrated my point. Disney of the Eisner era didn't want to just snap out its competition by doing things the Disney way. The company wanted to expand into markets that allowed it to become an even larger cultural institution and wanted to enter industries beyond just entertainment. To bring this back around to Halloween Horror Nights, I think it seems perfectly reasonable to assume that this was the direction Disney was going. I very much believe that Eisner would have tried his own version of the event. Now, perhaps you're skeptical of this claim. Sure, Disney was releasing mature films under different labels and even dabbling in the nightclub business, but the park still had a very family-friendly atmosphere. To reiterate, Mickey's not-so-scary Halloween party premiered in 1995 and showed that Disney was comfortable with its own family-friendly rendition of a Halloween celebration. Perhaps it seems ludicrous to suggest that Disney might ever pursue a park experience that's intense and horrific. But is it? Because Michael Eisner certainly didn't seem to have a problem with that. Computer, what's happening? Loss of traction. Yeah. <laughs> 
Abort mission! People seem to forget that Disney is not a place exclusively for kids. Perhaps current leadership has given you that impression because of how much they're pivoting towards six-year-olds, but Disney historically offered experiences that were meant to appeal to entire families and not just small children. As I covered earlier, when Michael Eisner stepped in as CEO, he wanted to bring in young adults to the Disney space by creating attractions with more pop cultural relevancy. It was also important that attractions like Splash Mountain brought that thrill element as well, but even that was on the milder side of things. When the Great Movie Ride opened with Disney MGM Studios in 1989, and included a segment based around the intense and gruesome 1979 film, Alien. This particular part of the attraction didn't portray the gore and horror of the film, but it's still pretty intense source material to put into a family-friendly park. The monster of the film, the Xenomorph, makes two appearances here. First, it blends into the material of the ship before being awoken to terrorize the audience. The second appearance is an attack from the ceiling. While sanitized for the purpose of the ride, it's a good indicator that Eisner wasn't afraid to put R-rated content into the Disney parks for a more mature audience. While not as intense, The Great Movie Ride did also have a later segment that briefly paid tribute to the history of horror films, also revealing that scary content could work outside of the Haunted Mansion. Speaking of which, Euro Disneyland opened in 1992 with Phantom Manor, which took the template of the Haunted Mansion and overlaid it with a much darker narrative. The story is that gold tycoon Henry Ravenswood built a manor overlooking his mines, located over at Big Thunder Mountain. His daughter Melanie was met with four different suitors, all of which died gruesomely, no doubt due to Henry's interference. However, despite being warned not to disturb the mythical Thunderbird in the mountain, Henry continued to have his workers mine for gold. When the miners dug deep enough, they awakened the Thunderbird and invoked an earthquake through its wrath, killing Henry and leaving his daughter. She eventually became engaged to a train engineer, and on their wedding day, he was lured up to the attic by a mysterious phantom who suddenly appeared in the house. Upon exiting her dressing room, Melanie encountered her husband-to-be, swinging from the rafters at the end of a noose. There's more to the story of Phantom Manor, but it serves as yet another example of darker and scarier content being allowed in the Disney parks during the Eisner era. Another dark story would come to Disney MGM Studios with the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, bringing guests into the Twilight Zone and following in the footsteps of hotel guests who died in an elevator crash. Across the way would be Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith, bringing the first and only roller coaster with inversions to a U.S. Disney park. However, Epcot would arguably get Disney's most intense attraction, Mission Space. Here, guests would go through astronaut training and experience the G-forces that astronauts would feel leaving the Earth. That's the idea, anyways. And while the actual experience doesn't subject you to the actual degree of G-forces that an astronaut may go through, it's still quite intense. You of course also saw the clip of Animal Kingdom's Dinosaur, which brings you up close with the bloodthirsty prehistoric predators, and even Expedition Everest had the mythical Yeti swipe at you when it first opened. However, there was one attraction that rose above all the others in its level of horror and intensity. One day, Michael Eisner had the idea for a signature attraction for a major Tomorrowland refurbishment. He wanted to lock guests into a theater, where they would be terrorized by a xenomorph from the Alien franchise, slowly picking off crew members in a gruesome and horrific manner. In an absolute revolt, Disney Imagineers went to George Lucas and convinced him to talk to Eisner and tone down the attraction. While the xenomorph was never used, this new attraction called Extra Terror Restrial Alien Encounter would be toned down in intensity and was implemented as one of the five attractions in Lucas's contract. However, the overall experience was still quite intense. The attraction started with a pre-show, hosted by a robot, voiced by Tim Curry. Here, guests would witness a demonstration of teleportation technology, 
where a furry little alien named Skippy would be teleported into another tube. However, the technology glitches and Skippy reappears, burnt and suffering from pain. From here, guests move into the main theater chamber where representatives from the teleportation company, Access Tech, explain that they're going to perform a demonstration. The chairman of the company volunteers, and yet something else appears in the teleportation tube. Ladies and gentlemen, live and in person, chairman Oh shit! Uh, it's been long. Since when does punch have wings? Wings? <laughs> It's clear that some sort of monster has entered the theater, and the lights go out as it escapes. Guests are restrained in their seats through a shoulder restraint, and in the complete darkness, the show becomes a sensory experience where you can hear the monster running around and killing other audience members. At one point, the speakers of your seat would play crunching noises, and warm water is sprayed onto your face as if you were caught in a blood splatter. A key element of the terror was making each audience member feel as if they were being personally targeted by the alien itself. The audio of your seat made it seem as if the alien was getting close, and your shoulder restraints would press down as if it was crouched on top of you. You could hear it breathing behind you and could feel its breath as warm air and water was misted onto your neck. The floor of the theater was a loud metal grate, and during certain segments in the dark, cast members would run around the room allowing you to hear and even feel the subsequent vibrations of the alien running behind you. At the end of the experience, the alien is captured and teleported back out of the room, but not without psychologically scarring the many children of Magic Kingdom, despite the posted warning signs. It's certainly a thrilling and inappropriate attraction for the park, and with such poor reception, it was never introduced elsewhere. However, I do appreciate that it was trying to evoke an intense sensory experience with a creative executive like Eisner not being afraid to push for it. The Alien Encounter certainly has gained the status of cult classic, and I think it also potentially opened the door for something else. So, having established that Eisner was interested in competing with others, and that he wasn't afraid to include darker or more intense experiences in the Disney parks, I think it's quite plausible that Walt Disney World would have seen its own version of Halloween Horror Nights had he remained CEO. While Universal Studios Florida had introduced the event back in 1991, it wasn't until the mid-2000s, around the time when Eisner left Disney, that it blew up to become the premier Halloween event that it is today. Having seen its success and how much money it was raking in, I'm absolutely sure that Eisner would have attempted to compete and I can plausibly see it fitting into Disney MGM Studios. After all, Eisner was the man who originally tried to release a xenomorph into the Magic Kingdom, so nothing was really out of the question at this point. If this was the case though, what might a Disney version of this event actually look like? Well, look no further than Disney itself, because Hong Kong Disneyland has been offering scare mazes since 2008. While certainly not nearly as intense as what Horror Nights offers, these particular mazes employ the use of Disney IP to great effect, and are impressively high budget. However, I have noticed two fundamental differences. First, these houses are not straight walkthroughs concerned with jump scares, but instead stops groups in each room, allowing a scene to play out. For instance, this one room from the house called The Nightmare Experiment showcases the Mad Hatter as he pulls a person into the room to decapitate them with a pair of shears. The second difference I've spotted is that despite the intensity of some of the content, the houses also seem to lack the blood and gore that can be found throughout Halloween Horror Nights. This actually serves as the perfect template for what a series of houses in Walt Disney World might look like. These types of mazes that act as a series of show scenes would distinguish a Disney experience from other competing haunts, and in the interest of keeping it somewhat more family friendly, I wouldn't expect any gore to be visible. One thing that impresses me about these houses is how the Disney IP is used, like this room where Sid's toys come to life. However, with Disney's relatively recent acquisition of Fox, I can easily see properties from there being utilized as well. For example, a true alien experience that brings you through the tight corridors of the Nostromo would be fantastic. Just off the top of my head, a house that brings you up close with cursed sailors from Pirates of the Caribbean 
or through the woods where you encounter the Headless Horseman would be pretty easy to execute. Today, we would never see something like this because current Disney leadership seems to be concerned exclusively with the elementary school demographic, but it seems like a huge missed opportunity. There's this odd conception out there that Disney should be for children, when we've clearly seen that it has been quite successful beyond that. Attractions that stimulated intellect, like classic Epcot, or the more thrilling experiences from the Eisner era are certainly a testament to the success of not limiting your market to just one demographic. Halloween Horror Nights continues to stand as the most ambitious and high-budget Halloween event in the world, and that's a pretty positive thing. However, if things had gone differently at Disney, and Eisner was still at the helm, I think it's quite plausible, if not inevitable, that we would have seen a Disney version of this event at Walt Disney World. A Mickey's not-so-scary chainsaw massacre, if you will. Oh boy, I've got a date with Minnie tonight! Don't tell her, but I'm gonna surprise her With all of this being said, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this down in the comments below. If Disney were to bring a haunt event to the parks, what would it look like and what would the content of the scare mazes be? I certainly think that it's a missed opportunity for the company. As always, if you enjoy the video content, I highly encourage you to hit the like button and subscribe with bell notification to be alerted when new videos are released.